Rejoice, Civ fans! Today is a glorious day, as for the first time in this channel's history, we'll be covering the only good civilization in the game, the Ottoman Empire. Led by Suleiman the Magnificent, this Civ is the strongest late game superpower in multiplayer Civ 6 with a better balanced game mod. It has more production than Germany, more gold than Mali, infinite amenities and strategic resources, and it's all thanks to this unassuming looking unique building, the Grand Bazaar. Listen up, because once you master this Civ, you'll never lose again. For starters, this Civ is led by Suleiman the Magnificent, a leader so great that Firaxis decide to include him twice. His Kanuni persona is designed around war, with a powerful unique governor and one of the strongest unique units in the entire game. In contrast, Suleiman's Muteshim persona is more peaceful, simply gaining bonus stats for chaining Golden Ages back to back. We'll start by examining a free-for-all multiplayer game I played as Suleiman Muteshim. To start out, the Ottoman civilization does not have any bonuses in the early stages of the game. Like most civs with no bonuses, we'll be defaulting to a standard commercial hub opener centered around the Governor Magnus and the bonus yields he grants to internal trade routes. Before that, however, we have to figure out how we'll be hitting our first Golden Age. We have zero bonuses whatsoever to work with in the Ancient Era, so it's important that we plan out our Golden Age thoroughly. Therefore, we clear a Barb Camp, gold by a warrior so we can kill a second Barb Camp in the opposite direction, and settle our third city a bit further away than normal so that we can get some extra Era score for settling on a new continent for the first time. Thanks to all of this, we end up just barely hitting our Golden Age with 20 out of 19 points, allowing us to benefit from the 10% extra science and culture that our Civ bonuses provide us. We choose Pen, Brush, and Voice as our first Golden Age dedication, slam down a ton of commercial hubs, send traders to Magnus, and rush for the Feudalism Civic. As we spawn near a continental boundary, have a large amount of land around us, and have a ton of luxury resources nearby, we decide to go for the Ancestral Hall building in our government plaza and settle a ton of cities. There's very little we do differently from most civs at this stage of the game. One thing, however, is that we always go for a commercial hub in every city. Not most of the time, as with other civs, but always. Even our coastal cities prefer a commercial hub to a harbor, and this is because later in the game, we'll want to build our unique bank replacement in every single city in our empire. Around turn 47, after we start spamming builders with the serfdom policy card to improve all of our tiles, we realize that none of the great riders have been taken yet. Therefore, we throw up two theater squares and run some projects in them in order to snag some great riders before they become more expensive. In the early game, great riders cost only 30 great person points, making them a bargain. However, once five great riders have been recruited or the game reaches the medieval era, whichever is first, great riders will become twice as expensive. This is why it's important that we check the great person screen and saw that none of them had been recruited yet before we committed to placing down our theater squares. When playing as the Ottoman Empire, building out a robust cultural infrastructure is extremely helpful. Many of the Civ's biggest power spikes come in the civic tree, most notably democracy, a government with bonuses that are almost perfectly designed to synergize with the Ottomans' extra trade route capacity. As reaching this government will supercharge our empire, we always want to make sure we have good culture when playing the Civ. In the second era, we go for free inquiry as our Golden Age dedication for the extra science it provides from commercial hub adjacency. As we have a commercial hub in literally every city in our empire, we can use the Town Charter's policy card in order to get a ton of science from this dedication. If we were playing as the Kanuni variant of Suleiman, this is the point in the game where we'd be pre-building a massive number of warriors to upgrade into our unique unit, the Janissary. Janissaries are one of the strongest units in the game, and one of their greatest assets is that they're extremely cheap, costing even less production than a man-at-arms. This comes at the cost of reducing the population of every city that trains one. In order to get around this, it's important to build a ton of warriors beforehand and upgrade them using the professional army policy card in order to get a ton of janissaries without paying the population cost. Because the price of upgrading units is based on the difference between their production costs, the cheap cost of janissaries works in our favor here. 
It only costs around 70 gold on online speed to upgrade a warrior all the way to a Janissary with the discount policy card active. By combining a large number of Janissaries with the Siege Tower and the unique Governor Ibrahim's promotions for plus 10 strength against city centers and plus 1 movement on all units, they can easily steamroll civs incredibly quickly. However, as we're playing Solomon Muteshem, we don't have access to this unique unit. Therefore, we don't need to worry about any of that. Our only concern is rushing for the banking technology in order to unlock our unique building, the Grand Bazaar. This building has it all. It grants an extra trade route capacity, extra amenities, and extra strategic resources in the city it's in. We want one of these in literally every city in our empire, and we queue them all up right away. As soon as they're done, we start producing more traders until we filled out our trade route capacity. Because we've paid attention to building out our cultural infrastructure, we already have access to the Whistle Bank and Policy card, meaning at this point we get far better yield sending our trade routes to our allies instead of sending them internally to Magnus. At this point, we finally start to feel the real power of this sieve. The extra food, production, gold, science, and culture provided by all of these trade routes causes all of our cities to come online extremely quickly. The extra amenities the Grand Bazaars provide allow us to keep all of our citizens happy even with the extra growth the trade routes are providing. Other civs, jealous of our success, will want to use their spies to run the siphon funds mission in our cities. Therefore, it's recommended to run at least one counter spy which can cover some of the commercial hubs near our capital when playing this sieve. From here, we play fairly conventionally for a while. We continue to pay some care towards building out our cultural infrastructure, running projects to grab a great artist, and sending out some archaeologists. All of this is done in the name of unlocking democracy faster, which is the big power spike where the sieve truly becomes unstoppable. Furthermore, shortly after grabbing industrialization, we rush to unlock scientific theory. This lets us build some railroads between us and our allies, which increases the yield of all of our trade routes. In general, we can expect a roughly 10 gold per turn increase for every trade route once we finish constructing a railroad. Since we're on 23 trade route capacity, this translates into a whopping 230 gold per turn, making this an extremely lucrative investment. We make sure to train multiple military engineers so that our railroad can be finished quickly. The Renaissance era rolls around and we choose our third Golden Age dedication, Reform the Coinage. This dedication is the most popular one on most civs at this point in the game, but the Ottoman civilization benefits from it disproportionately. All of the extra trade route capacity we're gaining from our Grand Bazaars translates into a massive amount of gold per turn with this dedication. As we progress through the civics tree, we reach the first big power spike afforded to us by our high culture, capitalism. This civic unlocks the market economy policy card, which grants us an enormous amount of extra yields on every trade route in our empire. We have a lot of trade routes thanks to our grand bazaars, so this card is easily one of the best in the entire game for this civ. Shortly afterwards, we start approaching democracy, with its juicy inherent bonus yields on trade routes and 15% discount on gold purchasing. However, before we enter democracy, like all great civilizations, we first make a pit stop at fascism. This is because building a tier 3 government plaza building while in fascism unlocks the fascist legacy policy card for the rest of the game. So, as soon as we enter fascism, we queue up a war department in our capital city. Once it's done, we switch over to democracy right away. While we only spend two turns in fascism, we make sure not to waste them. Fascism grants 50% extra production towards all units in our empire and we put it to good use making a ton of cavalry units that we plan to upgrade to helicopters later. Now that we've entered democracy, we have an enormous amount of production, gold, and with the New Deal policy card unlocks, a ton of housing and amenities in every city. So, how do we leverage our excessive gold production and amenities? We bulldoze a neighbor with all of our tanks and artillery, of course. Our target this game? Wu Zeshin. Don't let her stats deceive you. Although she has much lower science per turn than us, her bonuses grant her extra progress from Eureka's and extra science every time a spy completes a mission. In reality, she actually has total technological parity with us, and is defending with equivalent units to the ones we're using. 
However, as we're playing the Ottoman civilization, we just have way too much gold in production for her to keep up with, and so we simply outnumber her army and conquer her civ without much incident. Our superior culture also means we have the fascist legacy policy card and the war department on our side, both of which help make this war much easier. Here, we benefit from another one of the Ottoman civ bonuses. Cities we conquer lose no population and gain extra loyalty and amenities. The lack of population loss in particular is a massive boon at this stage of the game, allowing cities we conquer to come online extremely quickly and start contributing to our win conditions right away. At this point, however, Persia starts executing their own game plan, killing our allies. Now, we could try to save our allies and help them fight Persia, but that's not really in our own self-interest. This is a free-for-all game, and at this point there's only really three civilizations which are competing for first. Us, Persia, and Norway. Everyone else is too far behind in terms of technologies completed. If we get into a scuffle with Persia, we're basically handing the game to Norway on a silver platter. Therefore, we form a gentleman's agreement to leave each other alone for now. From this position, we have to decide on a win condition to pursue. Really, it's a choice between science or culture. Currently, we're tied in terms of technologies completed with Persia, with Norway slightly trailing both of us. Ultimately, we elect to pursue a culture victory, but we could have gone either way. Therefore, we start building shopping malls and ski resorts everywhere, and start working on the biosphere in order to get some real tourism going. Once the biosphere is finished, we spam builders everywhere and place down as many wind and solar farms as we can, in order to bolster our tourism. The biosphere is the real key to our pursuit of culture victory in this game. Now that we've decided to play for our culture victory, we have to make sure that as few civs as possible get completely wiped out. Every time a civ fully dies, all of the foreign tourists we've accumulated from their civilization vanish from our total, making culture victory harder. Therefore, we surround Wu Zation's last city without fully killing her. This has the unfortunate side effect of leaving her entire spy network alive, which will continue to ravage our empire for the rest of the game. A bit later into the game, Persia has finished wiping out one of our allies, Mongolia, and has moved on to wiping out the other one, Egypt. We ally with Persia as we're clearly the two superpowers in this game, and doing so turns it into a race between our culture victory versus his science victory. Either way, we'll end up getting first or second, so it's a good deal for us. This also allows us to prevent him from fully killing Egypt to slow down our culture victory. By surrounding one of Egypt's cities with six of our units, we prevent Persia from being able to capture it. Since he's allied with us, he can't declare war on us and kill our units until the alliance expires. It seems as though he hadn't even considered that we might do this, but all's fair in Free For All Civ 6. Rewinding a bit to turn 97 and disaster strikes. The worst possible World Congress comes through. Great musician points can no longer be generated, and the spy operation Siphon Funds is performed at two levels higher by all spies. Not only does the lack of musicians make it harder to generate tourism, our empire is now overrun by every spy in the world descending upon it to siphon our money. We literally end up losing thousands of gold every single turn from siphon funds. It's ridiculous how badly this hurts our economy. It really stings that we have to leave Wu Zation alive with one city in order to not lose the tourists we've accumulated from her for our culture victory, now that her spies are even stronger. Still, the game looks to be going well. We're accumulating tourists incredibly fast, and Persia still has a ways to go for their science victory. It looks like we're going to coast to an easy victory when suddenly Hungary, played by the certified whack job streamer Papa Chillin, decides to start nuking our Chinese conquests. We didn't prepare enough military to defend against this, but our mainland is still completely safe. Our tourism is dropping as we lose Chinese cities, sure, but we should still be able to win from this position. However, disaster strikes as Norway also decides to gang up on us. They declare war on us for the sole purpose of killing the units we had surrounding Egypt's last city just so that Persia could finish it off. This is essentially just them throwing a temper tantrum and sabotaging us for no reason. Okay, so we lose all of the tourists we accumulated from Egypt and we lose all of our Chinese conquests. Suddenly, the game is neck and neck. 
It comes down to the wire, with us just being one turn away from culture victory, and then Persia snatches the science win. Just like the real Ottoman Empire, it takes the combined efforts of the entire world in order to topple the greatest civilization that ever lived. Due to the World Congress voting against us, the spies siphoning our money, and the unprovoked attacks by Hungary and Norway, we are just barely defeated by a margin of only a single turn. The moral of the story? Trust no one. Look at Persia, for instance. He sent zero trade routes to anyone else all game, instead leveraging his civs bonuses towards internal trade routes. In spite of this, nobody voted against him in World Congress, and nobody attacked him. I guess it's true what they say. Nice guys do finish last. Or, in this case, fourth. Thanks for watching to the end of the video. I'll be publishing the full VOD of this game for y'all to examine in the near future, so stay tuned. If you want to catch full games of multiplayer Civ 6 Live, be sure to check out my Twitch channel, which I've linked in the description. I also have numerous playlists on my channel containing guides for Civ 6 multiplayer, in case you want a more in-depth look at how to play the game at a high level. That's all for today. Person, signing out.